here we are. All right, guys, today I'm going to talk about mucopolysaccharidosis in dogs. Um, it's a very rare disorder, so you probably haven't heard about it before. Um, but it is pretty severe, um, and it is almost always fatal um, in both humans and in dogs. So what exactly is MPS? Um, it's a genetic abnormality, so it's caused by either inbreeding or just um, passing that gene along through uh, breeding within the same lines. Um, but inbreeding especially causes that defective gene to be present within a family. Um, it's a lysosomal storage disorder, so it's caused by the intracellular accumulation of incompletely degraded macromolecules, um, such as polysaccharides. Um, it's a progressive disease, and like I said before, it is fatal. Um, there are several types of it, though. The most common is MPS6, um, and that is an autosomal recessive disorder, just like all of the others, excluding MPS2. So that one's a little bit special. Um, so these are the breeds that are typically most affected. Um, these are all dogs. Uh, you'll see that MPS6 is the most common up there, but this usually affects miniature pinchers the most. That's the one we see it the most often in. Um, over here on the right, you'll see that this is a Great Dane puppy. Um, this is the only case I've ever found of this happening in a Great Dane, so I thought this was pretty unique. Um, but MPS6, to go more into detail about that, um, this is the actual name for it, I can't really pronounce it, um, but it is a recessive disorder. Um, this one is particularly caused by a deficiency in the enzyme ASRB, which is Erl sulfatase B. Um, this enzyme is responsible for breaking down the sugar molecules. Um, those are called glycosaminoglycans. Um, that's just a type of um, mucopolysaccharide, um, which is a chain of sugar molecules. Um, they are important for building connective tissues within the body. So you're understanding that like, when these are not being broken down, they're accumulating inside of the cells, which is going to cause a big issue because then they're no longer able to build healthy tissue in the body. Um, so the body is supposed to be constantly uh, replacing old cells with new ones. And so to do that, parts of the cells that we have must be broken down and then disposed of so that those new parts can be formed properly. So when this is happening in these dogs, they're missing those enzymes that break down those polysaccharides. And so those materials remain stored in the cells instead, and that causes progressive damage over time. Um, and puppies and infants don't really show signs of this disease, so a lot of times someone will buy a dog from a breeder and have no idea that their dog has this. Um, and then about two years of age, they start to develop some pretty noticeable and awful symptoms um, that affect this dog's life and become worse over time. So here are the MPS types listed. Um, you'll see that although there's like specific types, there are also subtypes. Um, that cause the same um, macromolecule to be stored, but it's caused by a different enzyme deficiency, um, like we see in MPS3 um, and MPS6. Um, so the glycosaminoglycans are the mu mucopolysaccharides. They're long linear unbranched polysaccharide sugar chains, um, but this still creates the subdivisions that you see with each unique, unique one. Um, so symptoms, this is quite a lengthy list because it kind of depends on which case you get, but there are a lot of commonalities between each type. Um, so we can see some eye cloudiness and lesions, that's pretty common amongst all of them. Um, slow growth, unusually broad chest. You'll see that most of these dogs have a very abnormally large head in comparison to the rest of their body. They'll have other facial deformities such as like a curved nose. Um, they'll have weakness in their legs, which typically gets worse over time to the point where they can't walk at all anymore and they have to drag themselves in kind of an army crawl um, like way. Uh, they also can get curved spines and enlarged organs, um, such as their tongue and their liver. Um, they'll have difficulty breathing. Their teeth will start to decay and turn into kind of a candy, cor candy corn color and shape. Um, their legs will get really tiny and lose muscular mass, uh, muscle mass, and their feet will get really large and floppy. Um, they can get fused bones, abnormal diaphragms, um, their breathing will deteriorate over time, they'll get really bad heart issues, so they'll have to do testing on that pretty frequently, dwarfism, bone disease, the list just kind of goes on and on. Um, and if the dog lives long enough, you'll see like the progression of all of these symptoms just get worse and worse with time. So it's very difficult to manage. So how we diagnose these dogs? First, we go in for like a physical examination because usually people will start to see, you know, my dog's like six months old and it's not really walking that great. Um, it's not playing like the other dogs are. What's wrong with it? 
Um, so they'll go in for a physical examination. If they decide to do x-rays, they'll see that there are some abnormalities in like the way the bones are fusing. They'll do a biochemistry profile to measure the lysosomal enzyme levels in the blood and liver. Um, they'll do a CBC, which is a blood test, um, to see if there are any granules present or neutrophils that are abnormal. Um, and then one of the most important ones is the urinalysis. So this urine spot test um, seems to do a pretty good job of detecting the disease. It's not always accurate, but each type of MPS is associated both with deficient activity of a specific lysosomal enzyme that degrades its specific um, glycosaminoglycan, like we showed in that initial table. Um, so when they're secreting these GAGs is what they call them, the glycosaminoglycans, you'll see them in the urine. Um, so when there's a high present of, presence of them, you'll see like this is comparison to the normal. Um, you'll see these probands form and like a strong color difference between the normal and abnormal. Um, so this can affect other species, mostly just in humans. Um, it's there's cases of it been in cats, and for cattle it's extremely rare. Um, but for people with the most common type, um, it affects one in 250,000 to 600,000 newborns. Um, this is an example of like a human skeleton. Um, you can kind of see some of the deformities um, in the skull here. You can also see like the joint dislocation and bone fusions that are happening, and then examples of like the candy corn teeth and how the teeth are kind of sharpening um, over time. So um, I follow some of these dogs on Instagram um, because it's not super popular and I thought their cases were kind of unique. Um, this guy in particular, his name's Tucker. Um, he goes under Tucker Wears Goggles as his Instagram handle, but he's an albino mini pincher, chihuahua miniature poodle mix. Um, and he had MPS6. Unfortunately, he did pass away at about the age of four. Um, but you can see here, these are his goggles used to protect his eye from like further damage. Um, and he does have that, you know, standard curved snout that you can see in a bit of an overbite or underbite. Um, this is another dog I follow on Instagram with the same disorder. Um, his name is Walter. He's also a miniature pincher. Um, and these pictures are good at showing, like, his bone deformities. Um, and, again, the overbite and uh, curved snout. Um, you can also see the cloudiness in his eyes here. Um, he has also passed away since, since these pictures were taken. Um, and then Winslow, um, my favorite, um, he is the brother of Walter, um, and he has the same disorder and everything. And here's a short video uh, just so you can see how this dog moves and what he looks like from all angles. Um, you can notice his curved spine is very prominent. Um, you can see the spindliness of his legs, his large floppy feet, again his nose. He's having trouble walking, um, and he has quite a large head to body ratio. Um, and they don't look at all like this when they're puppies, so you really have no idea that this is coming. Um, so treatment. Uh, there's no cure, uh, but treatment can improve the life expectancy and comfortability of these animals. So dogs with the disease can survive um, with physical assistance for several years, but their quality of life deteriorates pretty quickly. Um, usually they're euthanized once they're diagnosed because a lot of people don't have the ability to care for this animal um, and give everything it needs. Um, they can do bone marrow transplants. Um, if it's performed early enough, this can kind of restore them to a near normal state of health, not always. Um, there's also intravenous enzyme replacement therapy. Uh, this is a standard treatment for young adults that have been diagnosed with this disease between four and 12 months of age. Um, it helps reduce pain and non-neurological symptoms, but it costs a lot of money. Uh, it doesn't correct the underlying genetic defect either. It just increases the concentration of their missing enzyme, so it's not gonna cure them, but it will make it slower, if that makes sense. Um, then gene therapy is something that they're trying out now, um, trying to see if they can insert the correct genes that are necessary to code for these enzymes into their DNA or into their genome. So the prognosis isn't great. Um, bone transplant, bone marrow transplants have been seen to, you know, give them a relatively normal life for a while, um, but they do have to remain in isolation for about 10 days while their body recovers. Um, but a lot of times the condition progresses once it gets to two years so quickly that they have to be euthanized by five anyway. Um, but as like you saw the picture of the dogs before, like they were happy um, living their lives and they can still do that uh, with, with the proper care. Uh, but the main method to fix all this is prevention. So breeders should just definitely test their dogs to make sure they're not carrying this line um, and they shouldn't be continuing to breed dogs if they find out that they have this disorder 
um, and stop inbreeding dogs as well. And those are my sources. Yeah. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Questions, comments? Um, you, I know you said recessive. Was it autosomal recessive, probably? Mm -hmm. Okay, so like on the dogs that had it then, those clinical cases, that means mom and dad were both carriers then, right? So, um, yeah, there, obviously there's no cure. Now the, like for the human population, I guess if a couple didn't know they were carriers, they would have like, and then they had a child with this, and that would probably mean you probably shouldn't have any more children. You know what I mean? Because uh, how old do children live? How long do children live? And because if, if it's progressive, that means you can't see it, and then things start popping up, and most of those dogs died at two, three, or four. How about people? So in my research, I was looking at photos of like how this affects people, and I never saw any like fully grown adults. Yeah. So I don't think anybody really makes it out of adolescence. Um, but you know, I, yeah. I don't know that for sure. Right. And probably gene therapy was more concentrated on the human population yeah. because for dogs, you should try to you know get that out of the population and not treat it. I mean, you know what I mean. Ideally, you get it out of the gene pool, and you don't have it anymore. And Cattle might have it, but the large animals have very few of these genetic things. Why? Because if it gets sick, it dies or you sell it. You don't keep it breeding and stuff like that where dogs and cats we fix things and they might carry it on. But you should be you'd be surprised how healthy cattle are in general, sheep, pigs, as long as they don't have some infectious disease. But the genetic things in they're all kind of self-limiting. If one has it, they die and they're gone. It's amazing. And if you're interested in learning more about the disease um, and how it affects people, or like learning more about each individual type, um, you can visit the NPS Foundation um, online, but they also do accept like donations, and they have like a lot of their patient stories on there, mm -hmm. so it's kind of interesting to see how like these dogs battle with this and how it affects their owners, but also how it affects the families. Right. And here's another thing about the dog populations. You know, some of them are getting very inbred. And here's what happens genetically with inbred animals. They have an increased homozygosity of alleles. That means, like, let's say the big A, little A. That means inbred animals have more big A, big A in their population and more little A, little A. And if it's recessive, then inbred animals are going to express more of those genetic things. Because inbreeding, increases the A, big A, big A, little A, little A, whereas crossbreeding increases the big A, little A. That's why I learned the genetic. You guys know, one time years ago, I sat in on MSI 311. Some of you were in that class right now. It was kind of fun, because I could add little things as a, you know, me, but it was fun. Okay, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. And we're going to Hannah. But that's